Okay, so... Um, do you want me to read this? Yeah, what do you have there? This was... I put this up on Facebook. I must obviously spend my life on Facebook. This is Michael. Until recently, I only knew him as the guy who served me coffee in one of my favourite cafes. This is a post from Facebook from the 5th of March 2016. Then one day when I was scrolling through Facebook, I saw a post that had gone viral. It was the photo which made me stop. It was Michael. I started reading the post. This is a picture I've just uploaded to my new Grindr account. Grindr, that's a dating app aimed at the gay community. Yes, I'm single again. And while I like the picture, me, all moody with excellent lighting, it's what I've written in the Grinder blurb that is important. I'm pause, healthy and undetectable. Pause, as in positive, as in HIV positive. And undetectable, that's when you can't pass the virus on because the medication is working. For many years, I've allowed HIV play havoc in my life, hiding my status with my own shame and guilt, but also from society's bigoted judgments, especially the twisted views of my so-called gay community. This part really surprised me. Maybe I'm naive, but I would have thought that the gay community would be really supportive of people living with HIV. But Michael's Facebook post paints a totally different picture. I've been spat at, called a slag, slut, repulsive, I've been slapped about on two occasions, but no more. HIV is but a tiny part of who I am. I didn't know it was a part of who Michael was, but I was curious to find out why he'd decided it was time to go public and why that was such a big deal for him. It was about me, but it was also about the fact that we needed to start a conversation. There are lots of reasons why there needs to be a conversation about HIV. In particular, because last year saw more people being diagnosed HIV positive in Ireland than any other year. Almost 9,000 people in Ireland have been diagnosed with HIV since the early 1980s. And last year, there were over 500 new cases. Even more baffling is the fact that Ireland has double the European average. Not only that, but people are still dying of AIDS in Ireland. According to figures reported to the CSO, 11 people in Ireland died from AIDS in 2017. Seven men and four women. I want to look at what it's like to live with HIV now, in Ireland, in 2019. Through the eyes of just four people whose lives have been affected by the virus. Tony? I have limitless amounts of grief. Those of us who survived the period, in a way, weren't allowed by Irish society. We weren't allowed to grieve. Michael. People aren't talking about how you live with HIV. And two women, Rona. I have to pinch myself and say, I am HIV positive. It's almost like there's a shame culturally related to speaking about HIV. And Josephine. I have to say that becoming positive completely changed my life. I lost who I was. I lost my freedom to move around. I lost my freedom to be open. And even though people say you can be open with anyone these days, you can't. So let's go back to where it began. In the 80s. The mid-80s, AIDS was on our doorstep. This is Tony Walsh. Back in the 80s and 90s, he was a well-known DJ and gay activist. In my case, you're part of this increasingly vocal and visible sexual minority that's trying to sort of stake a claim at the centre of Irish society. It seemed like we had it all ahead of us. The first AIDS deaths were reported in the US when five people in California died in 1981. We had already been notified of early deaths. We were fearful. The government was dragging its feet. In the 80s, there was no way of stopping HIV developing into AIDS. It quickly got the nickname the Gay Plague, something that happened to people on the fringes of society. And governments around the world were slow to take action. It wasn't until 1987 that an official Irish ad came out, and it wasn't exactly reassuring. But today, if you play around, the stakes are too high because you're gambling with AIDS. Meet someone who is an AIDS carrier, and although condoms give some protection, just one act of intercourse may give you AIDS and lead to death. Sleeping around is a gamble. Casual sex spreads AIDS. In 1987, the ad talked about people being AIDS carriers. But we now know that it is HIV 
or the human immunodeficiency virus that people carry, not AIDS, which is a condition that develops from HIV. To a schoolgirl in the west of Ireland, HIV and AIDS seemed like a million miles away. In the 80s, I would have had an awareness about big movie stars contracting and dying of AIDS around that time. Rock Hudson, if I remember correctly. This is Rona. It's not her real name or even her voice. We've used an actor because Rona is too afraid to reveal her identity. She always seemed to be a passing headline that was about further afield and nothing got to do with my reality in my humble little life in my rural little village near a small town. And so that's all it was, passing headline. Did I relate it to straight people? No, I didn't. Absolutely not. Gay men. But it wasn't just gay men being affected by HIV. Inner city communities, the lesbian gay community and all people who, who suffered from AIDS were convulsed by the trauma and the horror in our midst. In the midst of all of the brutality and horror that people experienced in the 80s, there were also fun times. It's a strange paradox, you know. People were busy trying to live. In 1998, Michael had come to Dublin to study. I had left Limerick, which was grey. And party. To me, Dublin was an escape. It was also an opportunity to start living the life that I wanted to lead. You have this underground scene where the music starts to turn to all-night raves and all of a sudden there's a gay nightclub in Dublin, a club called Shaft. You're imagining at five o'clock in the morning when there's almost light coming down the stairs in the Shaft and they're playing stars. But the song would take on a different meaning. I know people have played it at their funerals. Tony was 25 when his friends started dying. It was the beginning of a litany of funerals from then on, right through to the 90s. One of my closest friends, uh, Ken Kelly, he became really ill. I mean, this is somebody who's really emaciated, has had pneumonia, has cancerous skin lesions on his face and body, had been in and out of hospital. But we both knew that he was close to the end. May 1994, I went over one day and we were having the laughs, watching Top the Pops and Absolutely Fabulous, and we ended up having a conversation around the funeral. Welcome to a fresh new look Top of the Pops from our new studio in L Street to open our show tonight, Erasure. Ken had decided he wanted to be cremated in Glasnevin Cemetery. He asked me to do the, play the music as his cremation. And then about a week later, I got a phone call from Mick, his boyfriend, to say that he'd died. Before the crematorium had opened, I was inside with a little ghetto blaster and a tape. And the family are sitting there just rigid with grief. But I remember the doors of the chapel bursting open. The coffin comes in, led by... Ken's lover Mick and all of the entourage and the first tune is Love is in the air Everywhere I look around uh, And um, Love is in the air Every sight and every sound Ken asked everyone to wear bright clothes and daisies Mick wore shades He looked like a glamorous Italian film star And then the last tune was Barbra Streisand's A Piece of Sky from Yentl. And Ken, being the fabulous drama queen that he was, sort of engineered the song so that just at the end, where Barbra Streisand is sustaining this chord for something like 27 seconds, I feel like I'm... Why? During that moment, Mick, his lover, has gone over wearing the wraparound shades, a huge bouquet of sunflowers, plonks the sunflowers on the coffin, and the coffin sails off. And I remember just that when the song ended, I thought, oh my God, I just want to get up and applaud. But I just thought, this is a spectacular production. <laughs> I remember counting at one point the number of friends that I lost, including a lover, and it stood at 43. That was years ago. There have been others since. The average age was late 20s. I don't think I'll ever get over it. What made that period even more traumatic was, apart from the senselessness of it all, Irish society stood by and, in the main, ignored our concerns. 
alienated people, marginalised people, compelled people to use rubber gloves and surgical masks while they were visiting, rolled out the most hysterical in infectious quarantining protocols that were wholly unnecessary at the time, but allowed people, many people died lonely, shabby deaths. It's impossible to just put across uh, just how distraught we were and just the damage it did to people. Michael too was watching his friends get sick and die. I'd go to clubs where you'd see people just disappearing week after week, so... And that didn't scare you or make you more careful? No, I don't think so. I just, I didn't think about it. I was probably off my head most of the time, unfortunately. I mean, I definitely was. I suppose I had a very laissez-faire approach to life. I took risks in everything. And I got away with it for quite a long time. Until he didn't. It was summer. I'd been feeling unwell on and off for a period and... Totally lethargic and kind of lifeless. It was 1998 and Michael went to see his doctor who did various tests, including a HIV test. Was my initial reaction was just totally blank. And then Michael got his diagnosis. I probably didn't take it all in and then suddenly the emotions start to flow and... HIV positive. You know, I think at 29 years of age you go, God, my life's over and it's a burden that hits you. It's shock, it's... Quite devastating, really. I was feeling lost. Hundreds of people died from AIDS in Ireland before any kind of treatment was found. And then, in the mid-1990s, antiretroviral treatment was introduced, which could stop HIV becoming AIDS. And yet, despite these advances in medication, the outlook seemed dark to Michael. Death and mortality and all those things come into play. He did start thinking about, oh my God, I've got AIDS, and that's not what you have, you have actually got HIV. That very same year, another person from a completely different background was facing her own problem. Going into this hotel in North Dublin to meet a lady with, who's been living with HIV for a number of years. And I can't say her name and I'll have to change her voice somehow because she doesn't want to be identified. I'm a 69-year-old woman from rural Ireland and I've been HIV positive for 20 years now. This is Josephine. It's not her real name, and it's not her voice. But these are her words. I had a nice upbringing. Small town, big family, very comfortable, very happy upbringing. At the moment, almost a quarter of the people diagnosed with HIV in Ireland are women. Went to boarding school and all that, so I'm not what, at the time, people thought would become positive. I still feel I'm not what people would ever think was positive. By the time she had reached her late 40s, life was good for Josephine. She was living overseas, she had a great job, she was happy and healthy. Normally, I'm a really high-octane person. Until she wasn't. And I was just tired, that's all. Just very, very, very tired. No energy, that's all. Nothing else. Josephine's doctor arranged for her to have some blood tests and because she worked in the medical industry she was able to do the test through work and access the results herself. And then I thought oh well I'll just look at my own results. I was expecting to find I was anemic or something like that. HIV positive. I actually fell into the chair from complete and utter shock because I thought I couldn't be. Josephine will never know for sure how she got it. And not knowing is a hard thing for her to come to terms with. It plagues you. You keep going back, even after all these years. You still go back over and over and over it, trying to figure out how you got it. What did you do? Because you think you can tell by looking at someone, and you can't. Josephine was living in a country which was hostile to people living with HIV. Now remember, this is 20 years ago, so at the time, if ever anyone was diagnosed, they lost their job immediately. You're fired. Instantly. I had to get out. It was good it was the weekend, so I had time to get organised. Literally, I lost my job, my home, my cat, my income, my savings, everything. I phoned the people who I knew who could get me out. 
But I was in complete shock, and at that time I was sure I was going to die anyway. It was just a matter of getting home or dying somewhere else, and I really did not want to come home. I had no option. I could have been put in jail. I look at myself sometimes and I wonder, can people see this in my face? This is Rona. She's the other woman I met who doesn't want to be identified. Is it noticeable? I spent two years trying to find women like Josephine and Rona who are willing to talk to me about their experience of living with HIV. In 2019, it seems the stigma is still too great for a woman to admit that she's HIV positive. Today, Rona is driving to one of her regular checkups at her local HIV clinic. I get up early in the morning and on that day, nobody else knows. And I often think that I'm on this road way out of town from where I live. And I often think, if anything happened to me, would people ask, what was she doing going there? It's that secrecy that accompanies me on an ongoing basis. In 1997, Rona was in her late 20s. She had moved to Dublin to study and was happy and healthy. Until she wasn't. She was in the middle of her college exams the day that she got her results. HIV positive. The audio switched off and I began to see lips moving. I didn't hear any more sound for I don't know how long. Maybe 30 seconds maybe a minute, maybe five. But it was almost like an internal paralysis or something. I got HIV through sexual activity, unprotected sexual activity. And I have narrowed it down to two different people. Yeah. I honestly didn't know them very well, so I never traced that. After she got her diagnosis, Rona got on her bike and cycled back to do her next exam. Pedalling away. It was the 20th of May and (laughs) all that was going around in my head was, why today, the 20th of May? Why today, the 20th of May? For Rona, telling her family wasn't a positive experience. I told two of my siblings first. Today, I regret that. I really regret that. I think the worst experience when I told somebody was my sister was, this was about 99. I didn't tell them straight away. Her reaction was shock and fear. And her words were, does that mean you're going to get very sick and die? And that was just one of the saddest things I really ever had to hear. Because I had to think about that and I thought, well, I hope not. For Josephine, the other woman in this story, on receiving her HIV-positive diagnosis, she returned to Dublin. While she waited for a hospital appointment, she lay in bed, thinking about the life she had lost. A bloody fine life. (laughs) And what was ahead of her? To waiting for death, mostly. Being absolutely terrified to talk to people. And then just trying to find a way to have some kind of life. I remember being totally, totally, totally lost. That was it. I was 48. Josephine made her first visit to the HIV clinic in Dublin, and it was a bit of a shock. The first time I went to James's, I was all posh, dressed up. There were a lot of drug addicts, and there was also what was obviously criminals because they were handcuffed to guards. This was not what I was used to, so I was wearing my white fur coat. I didn't fit in. Within a few short weeks, Josephine's life had changed dramatically. When I was diagnosed first, I thought I must be a really bad person. I stayed in bed every day. Couldn't get up. When you're taking 16 tablets twice a day, you don't have motivation. Michael's medical treatment started immediately. But like Josephine's regime, in the beginning, the treatment was very intense. I think I initially took something like 14 tablets a day at different times of the day. And you had to go to the clinic every three months at that stage. You know, you had, they tested various things and you were given your medication. As time went on, Michael's lifestyle started to interfere with his HIV treatment. 
it was that regiment element of you had to take them in a certain time and time didn't matter to me at the time. My life was pretty chaotic. He found himself drifting away from his medication. And it just ran into six months and a year and two years and that was kind of it. And I, I suppose when you're high, life is great. <laughs> That's the way it was for me. I think I was off my medication for about two and a half years or so. Rona also decided not to take the HIV medication she had been prescribed. I had a huge resistance to that. I just didn't want to start on medication immediately. I just wanted to know my body a little bit and started doing different things, you know, yoga and food and all of that. And I thought, I can do this without medication. I was still attending for tests, you know, in my own body. I didn't feel like I was getting any worse. I felt something was contained and I trusted that. Rona was in her late 20s. She found herself very isolated romantically. She no longer felt that having a relationship with a man was an option for her. I just didn't trust the world, that was it. And really I wasn't in a place to be in a relationship, even if I wanted to be in one. I just wasn't in that place. There was one just gorgeous guy, really lovely, lovely guy. But it was purely platonic because I just couldn't go there. It was too big. I didn't feel safe enough. I really didn't. Not after that. I just didn't. Rona rarely talks about her HIV status nowadays. This is just a non-spoken about subject in general. I tell my closest of friends if I was diagnosed with cancer or MS or anything else, I know people would be asking me, how am I doing? on a very regular basis. This is so secretive. It's so, in a sense, unfair because of that fear of people judging or not wanting to know me. Josephine too felt that she was very socially isolated. People were afraid to be around me. They were afraid that I could contaminate them. Afraid to hug me, afraid to come near me, to talk to me. And it was almost the case of the separate knife and fork and spoon. They were afraid to let me in their houses. I remember one person, an in-law, not letting me into the house. She opened the door and told me to go away. She said, we don't know what to do with you. We don't know whether you could contaminate us or what. Luckily, my brother heard it and said, let her in. But again, I couldn't hug them or do anything like that. That was very hard. I've known a lot of HIV-positive women over the years and I think only one that contracted HIV through blood transmissions. Talking with her, it's just so different because the blame was on someone else. It was almost like I and other women in those groups that had contracted HIV through sex, you know, there was something more shame-based. Almost like I don't deserve to be met by the world with a sense of compassion. And that's just nonsense. A woman with HIV will definitely be looked down upon. She has to have had at least 25 million partners in order to catch it. It hasn't been an easy road for Michael either. I became quite regressive about it and I stopped being very public about it and a lot of people still think of it as the gay plague or that it's death and you know when you get physically attacked I had one guy who kind of chased me down in the sense of we would have been in a, in a bar and would have flirted with me and I probably told him that I was HIV and when we got back to my apartment he just started to beat me up telling me that I was disease ridden and another guy beat me up after after we'd had sex he wanted to have sex but then he beat me up um, but people would spit at me in, in the George I suppose you're kind of you put on a brave face and you just get on with it but it does, it breaks you down At times the isolation and stigma associated with HIV have felt too much for Josephine I wanted to die for a long time because I couldn't live the life I wanted I just felt poisoned 
I knew how awful it would be if I let myself die from the HIV. The isolation is a huge thing that people don't know. It's constant. Because you can't put yourself forward, it's very hard to be friends with people if you can't be honest. I live in the country, and where I live, the neighbours would kind of go, oh my God. I have one friend who knows, and she's just delightful. I'd be totally lost without her. I can trust her implicitly, but what I'm learning is I can't trust anyone else. According to a study from the International AIDS Society, suicide rates among HIV-positive people are around three times higher than the general population. I do still often think about ways to die because it's so isolating. I resented it an awful lot for a long time. I really, really, really resented it and I was very angry. I never got my life back. In 2002, at the age of 34, Rona finally met someone she was willing to have a relationship with. I was very upfront with him. We didn't sleep together immediately, but we got close very quickly. I came clean and told him when we were walking on the beach. He appeared to be completely accepting, really okay with it. We did use protection mostly and then we very consciously didn't. He really wanted a child. We talked together in the clinic about having unprotected sex, about everything. And he was very willing at that time to have unprotected sex. I was 35 when I became pregnant. Only when she became pregnant did Rona start to take her HIV medication. I was then told that legally I had to go on medication to protect the health of the child and that was not an issue for me. I wanted this child to be as well as it could be. During the pregnancy, the thread of fear was all around. Will she be okay? And would she be positive? It was absolutely terrifying. The responsibility felt awful. She was born very well and underwent some tests then and at 18 months she got the absolute all clear. No HIV in her system. Nothing detectable. Tremendous relief even though by then she was the healthiest baby. So something in me I think knew she is free of this. Josephine is almost 70 and single. I haven't had a date in donkey's ears. I wouldn't know how. I would like to be in a relationship. Maybe. I don't feel I'm very good at them. But um, it would be nice to have the option. And I don't feel that I have. After the birth of her daughter, Rona's relationship began to break down. It became the elephant in the bedroom. (laughs) And so many sexual moments were tinged with this kind of awkwardness, just lack of ease. And doctors were putting a lot of pressure on as well. Never have unprotected sex. (laughs) It was a stress. And Tony Walsh? By 2005, Tony had survived the AIDS pandemic of the 80s and 90s. For years, I... This sounds really perverse, but I felt guilty that I wasn't HIV positive. Tony had spent 20 years working as a gay activist in the areas of civil rights, history and the arts. He was happy and healthy. Until he too wasn't. He discovered that he was HIV positive. I was appalled I got diagnosed at the age of 45 because I'd spent a lifetime advocating for safer sex and for, for responsibility in, se- in one's sexual behaviour. But in my case, I, um, I actually got raped, and that's how I became positive. Tony never reported his rape. Your man left, and I cleaned up and went to bed. And I suppose I'm a walking cliché. I'd be typical of men and women who have been sexually assaulted or raped in that I just felt, I felt guilty for allowing the rape to happen in the first place. So I was just, well, I was ashamed that I could allow myself, in my head, I was ashamed that I allowed myself to become HIV positive. By 2011, Michael hadn't taken his medication in around two years. 
but he was about to get a wake-up call. I had a best friend. His name was also Michael. He was more than my best friend. He was my, my wingman. Life was, life was a lot of fun together. Like myself, he was HIV positive. He was 35. The medication was really badly affecting Michael. You know, he had stomach issues and, and diarrhea and vomiting, which was, a lot of people did suffer from. And I think he was just like, well, you're doing fine. I'm going to do it. And he had been feeling unwell for quite some time. But like all of us who lived that kind of crazy life of clubs and excessive alcohol and drugs and head and sand, we just didn't manage our our health properly. And then one day, a friend of ours brought him into A&E. And when I got to A&E, the scene was like a car crash. There was medical supplies all over the floor and um, he basically had been rushed into ICU. And we spent, I think, about five or six weeks living in ICU where they induced him into um, a coma. We had to tell his family. Michael never recovered and died in hospital. It's hard. It's really hard to to understand why somebody so young and so fabulous and so beautiful, why their life was lost. Um, or it shouldn't happen in, in society nowadays where somebody so young would use their life because the advances in medication are, are amazing. It just shouldn't have happened. You don't realise until that person is gone just how important they were in your life. I'm here and unfortunately he's not. I do have some guilt about it, I have to say. But I think I've, I've turned that guilt into a positive and I actually didn't go back onto my medication until the third week that Michael was in a coma. I was then like, OK, oh my God, that could be me there in ICU. And... Uh, I went back to the guide clinic and started. When I actually made my appointment for the guide clinic, my CD4 level, which is your white blood count, was actually 189, and 200 is where you're in danger. So, um, yeah, I'm a very lucky person, taking one tablet a day. And that's just the advances in science, which we're very lucky with. A recent UN report warned of a dangerous complacency with regard to HIV infections worldwide. Just last week, nine new people in Ireland found out they were HIV positive. And so far, 2019 is on track to, again, have the highest number of HIV diagnoses on record. Kids will think nowadays, oh, it doesn't matter. I can just get the medicine and I'd be fine. That's not how it works. You have to decide who you can trust, who you will actually say to, well, I'm HIV positive, and then hope that they will react positively. Excuse the pun. And sometimes they don't. And they disappear out of your life very quickly. I'm not ashamed to be HIV positive, but neither am I proud. There's nothing sexy about it. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. You know, it's a manageable long-term illness, but it's not without its complications, and they all bring risks with them. In my case, I take a pill every day, and while it keeps me alive and it stops the HIV from turning into AIDS, and also, remarkably now, it also means that I'm no longer infectious. I could, for argument's sake, have unprotected sex with another man and not infect him. But the flip side of that antiretroviral therapy is that I'm I'm at increased risk of heart disease and multiple organ failure. As far as Josephine is concerned, education is the key to reducing the numbers of people contracting HIV. The education I would like to see is get into the schools and I wish I had the courage. I don't have the courage to go into the schools and say, this can happen to you. Despite all the medical advances in the treatment of HIV over the last 20 years, it seems to me that we have a very long way to go in Ireland before we can banish the stigma of being HIV positive. To go out and disclose that I'm HIV positive and... No, I'm just 
I just feel I'm not ready to do that now. If ever. I've to hide and I think, why am I hiding? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense on one level. Even Rona's teenage daughter does not know about her mother's HIV positive status. She has started secondary school and she has come home on at least two occasions telling jokes about AIDS. And it has been quite shocking to be on the receiving end of that. I don't know what it would mean for her if I told her, but I know that I'm not ready to go there. I feel that she has enough to be coping with. <laughs> and do I want to have to answer questions? And do I want her looking at me through different eyes? I don't know how she would look at me, but something would change. The people that I've spoken to in the course of making this documentary have found different ways to deal with their HIV status. Ways to get through the tough times, the isolation, the stigma. After many years of being single, Rona has finally met somebody that she can trust. She's now in a happy relationship. It was real important to me to be upfront, but everything is still working well. But now we do know that when on medication, when viral load is suppressed, that undetectable means untransmissible. Tony has poured his life experiences into a one-man show called I Am Tony Walsh. My response to being raped and becoming HIV positive was to, first of all, bottle it up and then write about it in my journals and then eventually talk about it and talk about it in public. But it actually took me 10 years to talk about it. Josephine now regularly goes to Africa to work with families affected by HIV. I've become involved in charities, and that is an amazing experience from every point of view. That is my life now, doing the fundraising. It gets me out. The first time was really funny because I thought if women can see that I can be my age and alive, it will give them hope. That was my goal in going. But it did me so much good to actually stand up in front of people and admit it. I just said, my name is... And I'm HIV positive. You could see all the mouths drop. They just couldn't believe it. So I just talked about my experience and how it felt to be there and with this group and how it made me feel normal again. The last couple of years I got to talk to some of the older women. One woman just looked at me and she started crying and she said, You mean I could see my grandchildren? Just one person got hope, and that's the best you can do. That made the trip worthwhile. Use what I have that's bad to make good. Remember Michael's Facebook post? Over 27 months ago, I admitted and accepted that I no longer had control over my life and was cross-addicted to a multitude of substances. I sought help and from my first day in treatment promised myself to live an honest life. To live a life without fear. It's taken me until recently to banish my last fear, my HIV. Through hard work and a lot of pain, I'm no longer willing to allow HIV devastate my life. I've come to understand it was a major trigger for my addictions and the cruel loss of my beautiful best friend from HIV was the final trigger that could have destroyed me. Michael is still single and on Grinder, and he recently got a dog. She's a golden doodle. So she came to me about 18 months ago. I call her my emotional support dog because she just came at the right time and I got out of bed every morning instead of closing the curtains and hiding away from the world. And, and, you know, big fluffy ears and a waggly tail in the morning. What do you want to do but get up and have the the crack? Can you go for a walk? As I said in the Facebook post, it's just that it's a tiny part of me. So... I'm very careful with my medication now. I make all my appointments. Um, I live a healthier lifestyle. That's combined with the, having had the treatment for addiction. My life has just gone a complete 360. I want to live my life. You know, if you've lost somebody as, as amazing as your best friend, you don't want to go through that yourself. I suppose it's hit the memory of Michael that would really make me yeah, want to keep going till I'm about 110. <laughs> 